As a digital artist, you're constantly looking for new ways of visually enhancing your illustrations, one of the most commonly used methods being that of applying textures through the use of brushes. As we speak, there are thousands of thousands of brush packs out there, but what if you find yourself in the position where you actually need to create one of your own? Well, the process of creating custom brushes inside of Illustrator can sometimes prove to be a real challenge, since most of the times it will require you to think outside of the box due to the fact that there are multiple methods of achieving the same result. Being it so, I'm going to share with you some of my secret recipes and bring you along as I start building 3 different brushes from scratch and then show you how you can use them in order to bring your illustration to life. I'm Andrew and you're watching an Envato Thoughts Plus Illustrator based tutorial. Before we begin, I wanted to point out that by default, the software comes pre-packed with a couple of brush packs which can be found by opening up the brushes panel and then clicking on the brush libraries menu. Here you'll find 8 distinct categories which contain different brush types that you can select and then use with the help of the dedicated paintbrush tool. While they're not bad by any means, in some cases they might end up limiting your creativity which is why sometimes you'll want to take the time and create one of your own that is intended to fill in a specific need. In our case, we're going to take a look behind the process of creating a custom paintbrush, a scatter brush, and then a textured one using nothing more than some basic geometric shapes and effects. That being said, let's kick off our little project by heading over to File, New, or by using the Ctrl N keyboard shortcut to create a new document, which will then adjust according to our needs. First, make sure that the profile is set to Web, since we're going to be using our brushes within the digital medium. If we move on down, we have a number of artboards, which we're going to set to 3, followed by spacing, which we're going to leave at 120 pixels, so that we can clearly separate our brushes in the building process. Finally, we're going to set the width of our artboards to 600 pixels, and then their height to 280 pixels, and then simply hit OK once we're done. Now that we've finished setting up our project file, we can zoom in on the first artboard, where we're going to gradually build our custom paintbrush. Before we begin, we're going to want to clear out all the default brushes. To do so, simply open up the brushes panel and then from its advanced menu, click on select all unused, removing them afterwards using the delete brush button. Once you're done, select the blob brush tool, which can be found underneath the paint brush tool or by using the shift B keyboard shortcut and then draw a short horizontal line, making sure to keep it as straight as possible. As soon as you have your line, switch over to the eraser tool and then adjust its shape by cutting off its round ends, making sure to remove the remaining segments afterwards. Next, we're going to give it a more hand-drawn look by heading over to Effect, Distort and Transform, Roughen, we should bring up a new window prompt that will allow us to fine-tune the effect. Before we begin, make sure that the preview box is checked so that we can actually see what each option does. Once you're ready, start by setting the size of the effect to 1 or 2 pixels using an absolute value and then lowering its detail all the way down to 4, making sure to set the points to smooth. As soon as you hit OK, Illustrator will apply the effect to the shape as a live effect, which we're going to change by heading over to Object, Expand Appearance. Create two copies of the resulting shape, which will position above and below the original making sure to adjust them afterwards by shortening their width and height in order to add variation. Once you're happy with the result, select all three shapes and then combine them into a single larger one by opening up the Pathfinder panel and then using it to night shape mode. Before we move on, we need to change the color of the resulting shape since otherwise we might not be able to do so afterwards when we turn it into a brush. All you have to do now is open up the brush panel and then simply click on the new brush button, making sure to set the brush type to art brush. Once you hit OK, a new window prompt will appear giving you a couple of options. We'll want to give our brush a custom name, leaving all the other settings as they are, all except for the colorization method which will set to tints and shades. As soon as we hit OK, our newly created brush will now be added to the brushes panel, which means that we can now select the paint brush tool and test it out.
Once we finish working on our first brush, we can move on down onto our second artboard, where we're going to take a look behind the process of creating the scatter brush. Start by selecting the ellipse tool and then using it to draw a 64 by 64 pixel circle, which will position to the center of the underlying artboard. Adjust the shape by giving it a custom grain effect by heading over to Effect, Photoshop Effects, Texture, Grain, and then setting its intensity to 20, its contrast to 100, and the grain type to stippled. Next, we need to turn the resulting effect into a raster image so that we can trace it later on. To do so, head over to Object, Rasterize, and then make sure that the resolution is set to screen, the background to transparent, and the anti-aliasing to art optimized, and then hit OK. Once we've rasterized the effect, we can now open up the image trace panel, which can be found underneath the window top menu. Here we're going to leave the preset to default, and then set the mode to black and white, making sure to enable the little preview box. Moving on down, we have Threshold, which we're going to set to 120, followed by an advanced menu, which we'll want to expand. Set the paths to 64%, the corners to 0%, and then the noise to 1 pixel, making sure to enable the Ignore White option. Since the grain effect is always randomized, you might get a slightly different result. So if you feel that you need to adjust some of the tracing values, please go ahead and do so. Once you're done, click the expand button which should give you a vectorized trace of the rasterized grain effect. Since we want the brush to be able to be used on smaller surfaces, we're going to select the resulting trace and then scale it down in half by right clicking and then going to transform, scale and entering a value of 50% within a uniform input box. As with the previous brush, we need to change the color of the resulting trace since otherwise we won't be able to do so once we turn it into a brush. All we have to do now is open up the brushes panel and then create a new scatter brush, making sure to give it a custom name. As you can see, we can't preview any of the adjustments within this initial window, so we're going to leave all the options as they are and then draw a short line using the paintbrush tool. We can then double click on our custom brush from within the panel, which should now give us the preview option. We'll want to start by lowering the spacing to about 60% and then setting the rotation to random, giving it a minimum value of 8 degrees and a maximum one of 48 degrees. Personally, I don't use a tablet, but if you do, you can further adjust the brush by setting both its size and rotation to pressure which will give you a different result depending on the pressure level applied to your tablet surface. Finally, make sure you set the colorization method to tints and shades and then simply hit OK in order for the changes to take effect. The software will then ask us if you want to apply the changes to our existing brush stroke, which we do. Once you're done, position yourself onto the remaining artboard where we'll create our third and last brush. Start by creating an AD by 42 pixels rectangle, which will position to the center of the underlying artboard. Once you have the shape in place, give it a custom grain effect by heading over to Effect, Photoshop Effects, Texture, Grain, and then setting its intensity to 4 and the contrast to 42. Next, we're going to want to rasterize the resulting effect, as we did for the previous brush, in order to be able to trace it afterwards. Once you're done, go through the same tracing process, only this time set the threshold to 96, the path to 84%, the corners to 0%, and the noise to 1 pixel, making sure to enable the ignore white option. Expand the trace, and then turn the resulting effect into an art brush, giving it a custom name, making sure to set its colorization method to tints and shades. All we have to do now is add the custom brushes to our library so that we can access them within any future project.
To do so, simply open up the brush libraries menu and then click on Save Brushes, making sure to give the file a custom name. You can then access the brushes by opening up the brush libraries menu again and then checking under User Defined. Now that we've finished creating our few brushes, let's see how we can actually use them in order to enhance an illustration. I'm going to open up an older project that I feel that would be a great fit and then I'm going to make sure that I get rid of the default brushes and load my custom ones by opening up the brush libraries menu and then going to user defined and selecting them from there. As you can see, I've took the time and layered my illustration so that I can quickly access these different composite sections which will help me when it comes to applying my brushes. That being said, I'm going to position myself onto the background layer where I'm going to start adding details to my blue sky. To do so, I'm going to select my custom scatter brush and after I change its color to white, I'm going to gradually draw over the two bean shaped sections using the paintbrush tool. As you can see, there's no exact method to applying the brush strokes, so just try to have fun with it until you get something that looks good. Since the resulting effect is too strong, I'm going to lower my opacity to around 24%, which looks more natural. Once I feel that I've added enough details to my background, I'm going to move on to the clouds layer where I'm going to gradually add details using the same brush, starting with the upper section of the foreground clouds. Now, since the clouds are actually masked using the background shape, I'm going to double click on them to enter isolation mode and then start drawing over them. As soon as I'm done detailing the upper section, I'm going to select the created strokes and then group them using the Ctrl G keyboard shortcut. This step is actually important since I'm going to mask them in a few moments, which will make the entire process a lot easier. Now I'm going to change the color of my brush to a slightly darker blue and then add in some details to the bottom section of my clouds, making sure to select and group the resulting strokes once I'm done. At this point, I can create a copy of the foreground clouds, which I'm going to paste in front and then ungroup so that I can turn them into a compound shape using Pathfinder's Make Compound Shape function. Once I'm done, I can select both my brush strokes and the copy and then mask them by simply right clicking and then hitting Make Clipping Mask. I'm going to repeat the exact same process for the background clouds making sure to adjust my color values as needed. Once I'm done, I'm going to group and then mask the resulting brush strokes, making sure to position them and the background clouds to the back of the foreground ones. Since I'm pretty much done working on the clouds, I can position myself onto the Zeppony layer where I'm going to add some noise to the lower section of the airship with the help of the scatter brush using black as my main color. Once I'm done, I'm going to group all the creative strokes together and then I'm going to adjust their appearance by opening up the transparency panel and then setting their blending mode to overlay, making sure to lower their opacity to 56%. Since I want the strokes to remain confined to the surface of the metal keel, I'm going to create a copy of its main shape and then paste it in front so that I can then use it as a clipping mask. At this point, I'm going to switch over to my custom paint brush, which I'm going to use in order to add a couple of paint scratches. First, I'm going to decrease the size of the brush by double clicking on it from within the brush's panel and then lowering its value to about 28%. Since the brush still feels too thick, I'm going to further decrease its size by opening up the stroke panel and then lowering its weight to 0.4 pixels. 
Using a light gray, I'm going to add a couple of horizontal scratch lines, which I'm actually going to vary by playing with their stroke's weight. Then I'll add a few more scratches using lighter and darker reds, overlapping some of the gray ones. As soon as I'm done, I'm going to select and group the resulting strokes using the Ctrl G keyboard shortcut. At this point, all I have to do is add some finishing touches with the help of the texture brush. With the color set to white, I'll simply paint over some sections of the sky and zeppelin and that's pretty much it. As you can see, using a couple of custom created brushes, I've managed to improve the quality of my illustration in a manner of a few minutes. That being said, I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you in the next one.